right on the money. So, Hello and welcome. I'm Rick Roller and welcome to tonight's exam item review. Yeah. Now what we do in these reviews here at the Institute of Real Estate Education is we go through specific type questions. Our topic tonight is, tonight is appraisal and uh, appraisal is a very popular topic on the test. And we will go through questions that will be similar to what you need to know the answers to when you're going in to test for your license. And we're going to start. Oh, and with us tonight, of course, is Mr. Dan Naylor. I, I, I'm I, Rick Roller. I'll be your game show host for this evening. And with us tonight is Mr. Danny Naylor, who is the owner of the Institute of Real Estate Education and our technical advisor and pro, program director for tonight, Mr. Dan Naylor. Thank you, Dan. And Glad we'll to be here. With the questions. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. We have about 18 questions. We're, oh, 17, actually. We're, we're going to go through tonight. And um, this is a very important topic, folks. All right. Well, number one, we have a vacant parcel. Hmm, cool. It means a vacant piece of land. It's being converted to a shopping mall in two years. Whoa. Love to own that thing. The owners of a small strip mall center located next to the new project have been approached about selling their property. What term describes a principle of value best describe, or what term describing a principle of value best describes the seller's determination to sell for more than what they would have before they became aware of the new neighbor coming in, the new project right next door? Wow, if you got a little strip mall and there's a big shopping mall coming in next to you, what do you think that's going to do to the traffic count for your area and whatnot? People going to the mall, they might want to come to your strip mall. Do you think you could raise the rent a little bit to, with your current tenants when your lease expires and whatnot? Man, wouldn't take too many of these types of uh, investments to make a significant difference in your uh, overall wealth plan. Okay, but what are we looking at here? Is it anticipation? Now, is it highest and best use? Is it substitution or is it conformity? Now, all of these four answers are appraisal principles. But if you look at this, has the mall been put in yet? Oh, sorry, I couldn't hear your answer. <laughs> okay, I guess it's just a one-way communication. But no, it hasn't even come in yet. But we anticipate it's coming, okay? Now, I had a situation almost exactly like this that happened to me uh, gosh, my first year in real estate. And I found out uh, because my sales manager uh, with the little company I was working with, there's only about nine of us there, but he he used to be in the FBI. And uh, one of his buddies that was also in the FBI with him had left the FBI and gone with a super big national, actually international mall developer, you know, as, as a, a consultant. And that that's what he did. He went out and acquired properties and helped build new regional malls uh, so here's his old fbi buddy and he kind of uh informed my sales manager that hey guess what you know we're going to put a new mall in uh, uh colorado where we were working it was grand junction and uh we put the rumor out that we're looking at the west side or the east side but i'm just telling you because you're my buddy you know you know, comrades in arms, and I don't know, they probably shot weapons together. I don't know, maybe they made some arrests together. Hard hard to say. But anyway, they were pretty tight. And we're telling everyone we could go either direction, but we're going to go to the west side. So I had a little property on the west side that came up for sale, and I sold it to one of my investor uh, friends. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was 10 acres. We paid $100,000 for it. When the mall was actually announced, what do you think happened to that 10 acres? By the way, it used to be an old pig farm. It's kind of smelly, but it was right across the street from the new mall. What do you think happened to that when they announced? And it wasn't it wasn't built yet, but they just announced. Well, everyone anticipated everything going through the roof, and we sold some of it for about a dollar eighty a square foot right away, and then we sold the last pieces for about three dollars and twenty five cents a square foot. Now. If there's 4, uh, you know, 43,560 square feet and one acre, and we had 10, that's that's pretty cool. You know, I mean, run the math on that. You know, that was an ex excellent investment for everyone. I got commissions going in and out, plus a little, uh, well, I mean, he gave me a Mercedes. Anyway, this, uh, but all because of the principle of what? Anticipation, A. 
So this is an easy one for me. And I hope that little story helps you understand that it hadn't happened yet, but people anticipated it was coming and therefore the prices went what? Up. Wasn't highest best use. It wasn't, you know, I mean, the, the zoning hadn't changed or anything else. It was just the, the fact that people, uh, you know, I mean, just common knowledge and belief knew that, you know, when the big regional malls coming in, it, it, it's going to increase all the property values around it, particularly on a commercial basis. We sold a piece to a bank. We sold a piece to, you know, and it was great. You know, life was sweet yeah, for about a year and a half. Number two. Hey, hope you're enjoying the video. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any more of them. And if you want even more review material, we have in the Prep My Exam link in the comments, we've got a plethora of practice exams. We have audiobooks. We have an exam simulator. We have everything that our students use to pass the exam on their first try. Okay. And if you want to get licensed in Utah, check out realestateonlinelearning.com and we'll hook you up. Number two, principle of conformity is a principle which states that the property's value is A, diminished by being too similar in form and function to the property surrounding it. Or perhaps it is B, highest when its, it, its form and use are in tune with the surrounding properties and uses. Cool. Yeah, that one's warm and fuzzy. Hang on to that one. See, the match of property and buyer bringing the highest sales price. Match property. That's, that's just, just sounds like gobbledygook. And D, an architectural term referring to matching the property with its surrounding. Uh, okay, of all these folks, the answer, of course, is B. Uh, conformity is a principle which states that the property's value is highest when its form and use are in tune with the surrounding properties in other words it conforms it kind of naturally fits in it makes sense uh it does not make sense like here in utah and in north salt lake where we have refineries refining re refining gas and other petroleum products emitting all kinds of noxious fumes and gases and you know lights working all night right next to a residential subdivision that is not conformity at all yeah, that was a real screw up in zoning. Okay. Uh, not the best use, but this one. So you understand conformity. Conformity means there's a natural flow. It works together. Okay. okay. Uh, I, mean, I love the appraisal part of the test. I wish they actually had more of an honor because it actually makes sense. Let's go to number three, please. Okay. As a component of real estate value, a part of the real estate value. The principle of substitution says that uh, A, uh, if uh, two similar properties are for sale, the buyer will purchase the cheaper of the two. Okay, I here's my use. Here's what I need. This one is real expensive and that one is a good deal. <laughs> Which one do you think he's going to go for? Okay. A B, if one of the two adjacent homes is more valuable, the price of the other home will tend to rise. Mm. C, if too many properties are built in a market, the price will tend to go down. Well, that depends on the demand, doesn't it? B, people will, will readily move to another home if it's of equal value. All right, so a component of real estate value, the principle is substitution. Okay, this is... This is how you value things. I mean, come on, this, this should be an easy one for most of us because we comparison shop. You know, you want a new pair of shoes, you know, you go down, you check a couple of stores, you, you know, find similar shoes, similar values and whatnot. So just like in the shoe store, the answer to this one is A, if two similar properties are for sale, a buyer will probably buy the one that's the cheaper of the two. Common sense, okay. All right. Well, I don't know. These others are, you know, they sound okay. They sound okay. But guys, uh, substitution says, if I can buy this one cheaper than that one, it just makes sense. They're going to go with the cheaper one. Okay. Principle of substitution. I hope this is making sense to you because, you know, this is going to be a big part of your exam. Let's go to number four, please. Okay, number four says the concept of market value is best described as what? As what? Is it? The price of a, the price a buyer will pay for a property, assuming other similar properties are within the same price range? 
market value. The price a buyer will pay for a property, assuming other similar properties are within the same price range. B, the price of an informed, unhurried seller will charge for a property, assuming a reasonable period of exposure with other competing properties. No, mm, that's, yeah, hey, that's sounding a little bit warm. Not the right answer, though. Uh, C, the price a, bu a buyer and seller will agree upon for a property, assuming stable interest rates, <laughs> appreciation rates, and price of other similar properties. Oh, boy, that sounds like a very uniform, everything's in under control place. So it's not what we happen in most markets. All right, what about D? The price of a willing, informed, unpressured seller and buyer agree to upon for a property assuming a cash price in the property's reasonable exposure to the market. Okay, reasonable exposure, I like that. I like willing, informed, and unpressured seller and buyer. I like that. And I love the price uh, that, or I like, you know, the stable interest rates, appreciation ratio price of the similar properties. Eh. The price of a willing informed, that's what I like. Unpressured seller, buyer agrees with the property, assuming a cash value, in the property's reasonable exposure to market. It is D. If you're leaning to that one, you guys are right on the money. Now, the reason we do these is because we want you to kind of experience a little bit of the anxiety <laughs> You're going to happen when you go over the exam. Oh, that one sounds pretty good. I don't know. This one sounds pretty good. But the cool thing is, is that there's only one out of the four that's going to be right. And so if you can eliminate one, okay, then you have a pretty good chance. If you can eliminate two, okay, these, I don't know. So down you, now you're down to maybe C or D, you know, I don't know, you know, let me see. And all of a sudden it occurs to you, wait a minute. D is more thorough. You have willing, you love willing, informed. They have to be informed, unpressured. No one's holding a gun in anyone's head or they're not you know, facing a, a financial problem that would cause more problems if they don't raise some immediate cash. Uh, a buyer agrees for a property assuming a cash price and property reasonable exposure. You know, it wasn't a hidden property and you know, it's been a reasonable, it's a D. Guys, it's D all day long. I hope you're on track with that one. And if you're not, I hope you are now. Number five, please. Okay, number five says a broker's opinion of value is not the same thing as an appraisal for which for which of the following reasons? Well, number one, well, the, you know, we can't call what, you know, as real estate sales agents and brokers, we cannot call what we do an appraisal because we're not licensed appraisers. Okay, so I, you know, <laughs> that's a really good reason. B, the broker is a market force himself or her short. Ah, ah. C, the broker's view of the market is contaminated by the influence of buyers. <laughs> okay. We love buyers. You know, the more buyers, the better. <laughs> I mean, that our sellers really appreciate it when we have plenty of buyers. D, the, the, the broker does not follow USPAP, which is uniform standards of uh, appraisal that they have to uh, abide by. You know, and there's a big book of those. So, you know, they have to know what they are. And uh, USPAP or you know, there's standards that they have to abide by. Well, what does that have to do with the broker price opinion? Well, nothing, but we're not appraisers anyway. You know, the most logical and easiest answer to this is A, the broker is not a licensed appraiser. And that that's the one you ought to go with. The other ones, uh, uh, D doesn't uh, B doesn't make sense at all. The the, bro the broker's view of the market is contaminated. Ah, nah, come on, give me a break. D the broker does not follow use path. Well, they probably don't, but that's not the reason we don't call what we do an appraisal. It's because we're not licensed <laughs> to do appraisals. Okay, now we could call it a broker price opinion. I call mine a market uh, a market study. You know, but. Uh, you know, a lot of brokers call it a CMA, competitive market analysis, but we do not call them appraisers, uh, appraisals, because we're not appraisers. Number six, please. <laughs> Having fun yet? Well, I hope so. I am. <laughs> eh, I don't know. I get excited about this stuff, and I hope you do too. Number six, the significant difference between an appraisal and a broker's opinion of value is. Okay, what is the big difference here? Uh, is it A? The appraiser tends to use only one or two of the approaches to value. No, 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 no. Appraiser is always going to use three approaches to value, not one or two. B, the broker may not be a disinterested party. 
How about C, the broker is subject to government regulation in generating the opinion. Uh, okay, well, all right. What about D, the appraiser uses less current market data. All right. Well, you know, I don't like D. I hope you don't either. Um, I, you know, really, guys, the one that stands out to me because it is the correct answer and I'm staring at the answer sheet <laughs> is B. The broker may not be a disinterested party. Look, OK, if I call a value here, I can make a deal. If I call it there, I can't make a deal. If I make a deal, I make a commission. I think I like to make a commission. So I'm going to call it here. So, you know, you're not disinterested. You have a you have skin in the game. You know, if you can get the value to come out, you know, buyer and seller are going to agree it's going to work, you know. And so, but the appraiser gets paid whether it closes or not. And that's why they don't have an interest in it. I mean, you know, they they have professional standards, they abide by, and we are kind of mentioned that, you know, a couple of questions ago, but Guys, B is the answer. The broker may not be a disinterested party. We only get paid when, you know, money transfers and whatnot, but the appraiser gets paid regardless of whether the deal pans out or not. And they get paid up front. Number seven, please. For the most part. Okay, the subject property. Okay, that's the one we're trying to create the value. You know, we're trying to figure out the value. It has a three-car garage. Okay, comparable one has a two-car garage. The adjustment should be. Now, is the comparable superior or inferior? Well, logically, uh, probably a three-car garage is better than a what? Two-car garage. Probably more buyers would love a three-car garage than would love a two-car garage. I don't know. You know, I mean, it makes sense. Even if you only have two cars, still, a three-car garage is cool, too, because you can store, store your lawnmower and your, you know, your motorcycle project, <laughs> lots of boxes, all kinds of things or, you know, uh, or you can move all the cars out and have a nice dance party in there. You know, wh whatever you want to do, it's just a bigger space and might even have better resale value because, you know, a lot of people need three car garages these days. Okay. So, you know, so what does that mean? Addition to comparable number one. Okay. Um, so do we have to add value or take value away? What we're trying to do in appraisal, appraisal is we're taking comparables and we are adjusting the comparables um, or we're adjusting the subject. You know, I mean, we, we are trying to make them like each other. So if there's an, see these comparables have already sold. Okay, they're giving us an indication of what the value is, but logically, Comparable number one, which is already sold, had a two-car garage, but having a three-car garage is probably better and probably worth more money, wouldn't you assume? Sure. So if that's the case, we'd have to add something to comparable one. We got to add a third garage. We, you know, we got to add it on. Now we're not going to go out there with hammers and saws. <laughs> we're just going to do a, an adjustment in the price that it sold for, it's because the comparable sold for this value. We know what that value is. But it, had it had another garage, making it a three-car garage, which is like the subject, which we're trying to, to do, we would add value. We wouldn't subtract value. Uh, and, and we wouldn't add it to the subject. We don't even know what the subject's worth yet. And we wouldn't subtract it from the subject. We always adjust the comparables. We do not adjust the subject property. All right. So uh, obviously, you know, with that long-winded explanation, we would make in addition to comparable number one. We're trying to make it look like the subject property. Now, what is what is the value of an additional garage? Well, I, you know, there's several different ways that we can uh, do the analysis to come up with that if we are an appraisal. You know, we can use cost, or, you know, I mean, we can use several different approaches and we have questions that, that look at some of those. So let's get to the next one. Let's look at number eight, please. Okay, the road in front of Jan's home has become so busy that she can hardly get out of her driveway without being beeped at, you know. Ugh. She's afraid to even let her children play in the front yard because of the heavy traffic. You know, that makes sense. I mean, their, you know, basketball rolls out in the street, they go chase and they get hit. Ugh. Horrible even to think about, okay? She's afraid to let her children play in the front yard. 
Okay, well, that's got to affect some attitudes about that property. What type of depreciation is Jen experiencing? Now, um, is this physical? You know, is it like peeling paint or, you know, broken windows or, you know, I mean, a physical deterioration? No, no, it's not. Is it functional obsolescence? Is, is this house worth less because, you know, it had something wrong with the floor plan, okay? There's functional depreciation, you know? Um, no. What we're looking at really is economic depreciation. This is something happening outside the property that's beyond the homeowner's control. And we call this economic depreciation because there's nothing wrong with the house. You know, physically it hasn't been damaged or, you know, there's a hole in the wall or, or the sheetrock is falling off or there's a leaking roof. There's no physical problem. Functional means that, you know, poor floor plan, perhaps things like that. No, what, the, what it is, is this is something near the property that affects the property's value for one reason or another but it's beyond the homeowner's control. It is called economic depreciation. You know, it might be a major employer in a market that uh, is closing a, a plant, you know, and, and you know, 35% of the people that live in that small town are all employed at that plant, whatever it was that they were making. Uh, and so they close the plant down. Well, then people move away, you know, and like, you know, <laughs> 35% of the houses in that area are for sale now. I mean, so it kind of, you know, and no new people are moving in because there's no employment. That's beyond anyone's control other than the, the you know, the, the people that own the plant. <laughs> so um, it's called economic depreciation outside of the property itself, but definitely affects the value. Okay. Look, you got to know these words. You got to know these principles, particularly in the appraisal section of, the test, which is um, very popular, you know. Now we have an analysis of which categories the questions fall under, and you know we're going to give you one of those as you know as you continue through your uh, uh, student experience here at the Institute of Real Estate Education. But um, it's beyond the homeowner's control, and it's outside the property. We call it economic depreciation. Number nine, please. Now, here we have an office building, and it lacks sufficient cooling capacity to accommodate the modern computer equipment. You know, modern, you know, I mean, here in Salt Lake City, uh, the NSA uh, built uh, a huge uh, computer complex. You know, it's a big spy center. It was the second one in the U.S. There's another one in the East, and they wanted one out here. And so, you know, we lobbied for it pretty hard, and we got it. It's all fenced off. You know, it's 24 hours security <laughs> wandering around. It's, you know, this is how they tap all your phones to listen to what everyone's saying, you know, all over the world and, and, and everything. And, um, you know, we thought it would be a major boom to employment and whatnot, but they didn't hire that many people. But, you know, they hired quite a few. And, of course, we had you know, everyone that built the building and the facility and everything. And, you know, it, it's great for the state. You know, we're happy to have it. Of course, it kind of puts us on the atomic weapon nuclear weapon uh list <laughs> anyway uh but whatever you know we were there anyway because of all our military uh stuff that we have around here particularly hill air force base but what we're looking at number nine is an office building lacks sufficient cooling and and i understand you know that that the modern day businesses you know they have big data centers they need to move into building but you know it's the building doesn't have enough ac you know to keep the building cool. Now, is that physical deterioration? Is that economic obsolescence? No. Remember, economic was outside, outside of the. This is something wrong with the building itself. Is it incurable? Well, it depends on what it costs to put in more AC and stuff, and you know, I guess. But, but really, as it sits right now, it could be incurable if it cost a whole lot, and we couldn't get a return on the money it cost to upgrade the AC. We're not looking at that. We're looking at functional obsolescence. It's looking at something in the building currently that causes it to lose a little value. And so D is the correct answer here. It's functional obsolescence. It might be incurable. It might be curable. You know, it depends on what it costs to fix it. You know, so that one doesn't particularly work. It's not economic. That's things outside the property. 
and it's not physical deterioration. It's not you know, the property is falling apart. You know, it's the fact that, you know, it's an okay building. It's just not adequately uh, air conditioned you know, for all the heat that uh, modern uh, computer data centers generate. So you're not going to get a, you know, computer data center guy to move in there, you know, unless you, um, you know, the owner of the building uh, increase the cooling potential. Number 10, please. Number 10 is fun. It's, a calls, it, it's talking about net operating income, or a lot of times we call it NOI for net operating income. Net operating is income is, is you know, what's the definition? What's it, what's it equal to? What, how do we come up with the NOI? Gross income minus potential income minus expenses. Oh, that's kind of warm and fuzzy. Hang on to that one. Effective gross income minus debt service. Okay, NOI has nothing to do with debt service. Now, yeah, you want the you want you know the loans and the building to be small enough that you can collect enough rent to actually pay the debt service and <laughs> excuse me and actually <laughs> maybe even make a profit. Uh, anyway, you look look see potential gross income minus vacancy and credit loss minus expenses. Vacancy and credit loss that's just money you didn't get. Yeah. All right, let's look, look at D. Effective gross income minus vacancy and credit loss. Okay, lots of different things here, but the one that is actually is, she is correct, potential gross income, which is what you could have got, but you didn't get some, you didn't get, you know, if you had no tenant, you had vacancy, you didn't collect any money, and you, if you had credit loss, they, you had a tenant, but they didn't pay you exactly what they owed you. It's okay, you know, I mean, so it that is the best example of NOI. Okay. Effective gross income minus vacancy and credit loss, it doesn't take into consideration expenses. You know, the biggest thing that creates your net is what your costs are. You know, so, you know, that doesn't work. Look at B, effective gross income minus debt service. You know, you just overfinance the property. I mean, we're not looking at debt service. We're looking at um, cost to operate the building, you know. And gross income minus potential income minus expenses. Mm -hmm. Close, but no enchilada. The correct answer is C, potential gross income minus vacancy and credit loss. In other words, gross income, not potential, but you're actually what you got. Minus what? Minus your expenses. Okay, so the money you got minus the expenses would give you your NOI. I like C. C is a good one. Okay. But your answer sheet says it's A. No, or maybe I mismarked it. Yeah, C is correct. All right. Oh, been a long day. Let's go and do number 11, please. But I'm glad I'm here. And I hope you are too. Number 11. I love the appraisal stuff. You know, the We're really stuff. glad you're here, Rick. You really yeah. know your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it, makes, it, makes, it makes a lot of sense. It just makes, you know, back in the old days, we didn't used to, uh, you know, in the 80s and what, we didn't used to license appraisers, you know. And so, you know, I actually did appraisals. I did appraisals for two credit unions and uh, uh, one little small, tiny little bank, you know, and uh, yeah, it's a little extra income. It was kind of fun to do. But when they put in licensing, I didn't, I didn't, I decided it, 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 I, it wasn't good enough. I mean, I, it, it was okay. I enjoyed doing it. It was fun. But, but uh, I, you know, it, look, appraiser makes four or 500 bucks. You know, maybe sometimes a little bit more, you know. Okay, all right, we'll give them 600 bucks. Wow, okay. What do you make as a broker? <laughs> okay, $500,000, you know, 3%. What's 3% of 500,000? It's 15 grand. What if you had all 6%? 30 grand. You know, I, I have a lot of appraiser friends that did appraisals for a number of years and they kept looking at those settlement sheets and saying, look what the realtor make, look what I made. <laughs> okay, so they quit appraisal and they became what? <laughs> real estate brokers i mean you know who wouldn't you know if you thought about it enough i don't care all right okay move moving along are you having fun yet <laughs> i hope so okay. look i know it's not going to be fun when you actually go do the real test i know there's going to be a lot of stress and and uh, you don't want to embarrass yourself and flunk and also it's a you know i mean you know every time you take the test you got to pay more money. <laughs> they don't let you take a retake for free, you know. So if you, hey, look at the way Pearson View does. Hmm. 
there's only so many people are going to take the real estate test. How are we going to increase our profitability? You know, we need to make them take it more than once. So, you know, they're not going to make the questions easy, but they're not going to make them unfair either. So you got to know your stuff and you got to know your definitions very well, particularly in the appraisal part. Number 11, here we go. The principal shortcoming of gross rent multiplier approach and estimating the value. Okay. Now, gross rent multiplier is a quick and dirty way that appraisers kind of come up with something. And uh, the gross rent multiplier is a number that you multiply times the gross rent. Then it gives you kind of a ballpark, okay? But what's the principal shortcoming of this particular uh, uh, method of coming up with the value? Well, let's look at our answers. Numerous expenses are not taken into account. Yeah. Okay. B, the multiplier does not relate to the market. Well, of course it relates to the market. That's how they come up with the multiplier. So that's not right. The method is too complex and cumbersome. No, it's really easy. It's just a simple multiplication. Hey, the appraisers go together for lunch sometimes. They go to their favorite sandwich shop and they say, hey, Sam, I got a job I'm, you know, doing out in, you know, the Riverton area, you know, uh, have you done any appraisals out there recently? Oh, no, I haven't. What about you, Nancy? You've done said, oh, yeah, I did a whole bunch from just a month ago. And I said, well, what do you use for a gross rent multiplier? And that's how they come up with it. You know, <laughs> Nancy, oh, I'm using five. I'm using six, whatever it might be. So you should have appraiser friends. Well, why would you want an appraiser friend? Because they'll tell you what the gross rent multiplier is. But it's not all that accurate. Because properties that are well-managed or well-maintained and better condition, they have less expenses to go with it. Really, you know, gross rent multiplier, it's a quick and dirty thing that they use to kind of come up with their price range. You know, no self-respecting appraiser is going to, you know, not do their more thorough analysis, which goes through all the expenses to determine whether they're fair or not and whatever else. But it does give them... You know, it, it gives them a neighborhood in which that price uh, is uh, lives in. And so that's so what do we got here? Well, we got all these four answers. Which one's correct? Well, guys, we're looking at a the numerous expenses, numerous expenses are not taken into account. OK. One thing that a lot of property owners kind of cheat on. Is uh, they don't factor in uh, property management expenses. And they say, well, I don't factor that in because I do it myself. You know, I don't have to pay anyone to do it. So it's really not an expense. Yeah, but it's a it's a time commitment. And therefore, it should be an expense that's, that's done on the most. Problem. But in order to make the properties look more profitable, they say, oh, yeah, here's here's our NOI. But they didn't take into consideration management. And that's a very um, lazy man's trick on how to try to get your uh, property values up a little bit. That's unfair. So no self-expecting appraisal will do that, but a lot of owners will. Oh, it's worth this much because of this, you know. A grocery multiplier, you know, but <laughs> eh. Okay. Look, guys, you need to make a lot of friends in real estate, but having a good appraiser buddy can be really important. And you know what? Appraisers are such nice people. You know, they wear very comfortable shoes. They drive conservative automobiles. Uh, they're down to earth people. You know, I love them, you know, uh, but a lot of people, you know, don't give them the respect that they deserve. But if, you know, if you give them the respect that they deserve, that you make them your friends and, you know, they, they can do a lot of good for you. So a uh, little practical note. Let's look at number 12. Please. Back to practicality. You got to get through the dang ex test okay number 12 which of the following types of gain are taxable well everything they can possibly think of <laughs> all right well let's look, look at our answers here according to the exam what type of gain what types of gain are taxable um number 12 is it realized gain i mean you actually made money it held for a number of years okay gain deferred for five years or more in a property held for years uh well, deferred gain wouldn't be taxable because it's deferred. It's got to be realized gain. Okay, I, so we're kind of leaning towards A here. Look at C, the first 10 years of appreciation of property held for 30 years. <laughs> okay, hey, that sounds pretty important. It's got the number 10, 30 in there. It looks official, but we're talking about, okay, 
we're talking about taxable. Okay. And, and again, uh, you know, when you sell a property and there's a capital gain, there's some provisions for that. Uh, there's even some provisions if it happened to be your personal residence for, you know, the time periods that, are, that would qualify, they won't recognize any gain or realize any, any gain because you put it into another property uh, or maybe you didn't have to, you know, depending on what this, the situation was. But, um, okay, let's look, look at D then. Uh, the only appreciation of the property in the year prior to the sale. Only the appreciation of property prior to the sale. Uh, what happened before the sale is, is not what we're really looking at here. It is, it is A. The answer is A, guys. Um, because it is the, the money you actually realized as a gain on the property that was held for any number of years. Okay. Now, some of that could be deferred if uh, right. you actually didn't keep it. You roll it into another property in a, in a, a 1031 tax deferred exchange. And in some cases, if it's your personal residence, uh, you know, it, it could be deferred and, and not paid at all. They don't realize that gain, you know, because you live there the appropriate number of years and it's just a tax benefit. Now, now un please understand this, okay? The tax laws are written for a number of reasons, but uh, but the biggest reason, of course, is to generate income for the government to run our society and our government and whatnot. But but also remember uh, that the people that make these rules and laws and whatnot, they're elected officials. And so, you know, they want to cater to the public. And so they're going to make laws that are favorable to the constituency, you know. And uh, so that's why personal residences where their voters live, there's often – you know, some priority given to property held for any number of years if it's a personal residence. So whether it's a personal residence or not can make a big difference. But realize gains on a property held for any number of years, you know, okay? That's going to be taxable. Yeah, and, you know, unless it's... Because they're not going to realize the gain. Number, number 13. Sometimes the tax codes have exemptions. And normally they would you know, influence a voter to keep that politician in office. Number 13, a taxable event, taxable event. Okay, that's something that happened where they could tax you. Okay, a taxable event could occur in a 1031 exchange unless, unless. <clears throat> that's why we like 1031 exchanges because you did the unless, <laughs> okay? A, the property proceeds from the property are we are selling are only handled by an intermediary. OK, it's called a delayed exchange. All right. Uh, OK, kind of hang on to that one. Eh, we'll see. Let me repeat. Um, we close the sale on our old property within six months. Mm. Let's close the sale on the old property within six months. Well, you know, I don't know. Not enough information there to really call out a good answer. Uh, number C, or letter C, the selection of our new replacement property is completed before the old property is sold. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, no. Okay. Got to sell the old before you get the new or you got to do it simultaneously. Uh, D, there's no boot. You know, boot is either uh, paid or received um, and that creates a tax. Um, this is unless, you know, I don't know. So out of all these, uh, if you know the rules on a 1031 exchange, you would go for A. And so would I, because that's the correct answer. The sale proceeds from the property we're selling are only handled by an intermediary. And sometimes we call us delayed exchange. You know, it's hard to get someone on the new property you want to buy uh maybe to wait uh you know so you know a, 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 a lot of times we find a uh buyer for the old property and so we go to the seller and say well the proceeds that we are getting out of this other sale are going to be used to buy your property but uh we need to actually trade the properties and then you know you'll get your proceeds really bottom line to you mr seller on the new property is that uh you get someone to buy your property, you know, they bought it through an exchange, but it doesn't really affect the seller on that new property. But it, it makes a great deal of difference to the a buyer of the new property who was the seller of the old property. 
Okay, if that makes sense. So the sales proceeds from the property you're willing are only handled by an intermediary. Sometimes if you have not located the new property yet, but the buyer on the old property is chomping at the bit to get it done for a number of reasons, you know, is that, hey, I don't want to sit around and wait for you to find a new property to buy. You know, I want to buy your old property. All right. So we'll do a delayed exchange. We'll do, but we can't, the, the buyer, or the, excuse me, the seller can't get the money. We have to give it to an intermediary. And there's a few banks in town and there's other companies that do this type of work. And uh, they are intermediaries. You know, one of the biggest ones is Wells Fargo. They have a whole department that does this kind of work. And, uh, you know, the, the, these are great transactions to work on because number one, it, it helps your investor delay the taxes. Now, eventually, it, and actually, you know, it's the only way I know you can actually get out of paying taxes because you can exchange, you can exchange, you can exchange, you can exchange, pay no tax, and then you die, and then you pay no tax because, you know, you're dead. <laughs> you, you don't care anyway. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a cool thing. Well, not the dying part, but it's really kind of a cool thing to do to get involved with 1031 exchanges and, and know how to do it and be an expert. And uh, one of the best places to go to, to find out a lot of this information is the people that do the intermediary work. And of course, we have a number of classes that you can take. We even have some here at the uh, uh, at the school, you know, that you or sections of, of classes at the school as well that actually get into 1031 exchanges a little little bit. But uh, hey, if you want to be an expert in something, I mean, you could be an expert in land, you could be an expert in farm and ranch, you could be an expert in apartment buildings, warehousing, uh, you could be an expert in single family homes if you want to. But, you know, uh, being an expert in 1031 exchanges is great because the commissions, you know, if you get all these properties lined up, you could have a three-way or a three-step transaction. I mean, you know, the checks could be 68, 78, $110,000 checks. I mean, you know, because you're selling all these properties are closing at once. <laughs> you got to do a lot of work on it as well and to get everything lined up and all the dominoes to fall down correctly. But, you know, that's what the intermediaries are there to help you with. It's a great thing to get into. There's so many different paths that your real estate license will open up for you. You know, and and you need to explore some of these paths. A lot of things. Hey, I'm, I'll, you know, I'm gonna get in. I'll be a residential agent. I'll have a pretty car. I'll drive around nice people. We'll look at pretty houses. Okay, that's great. But you can also specialize in other things as well. You know, like 1031 exchanges might be something you really have a knack for. And uh, you know, experts at this. You know, they're around, but they're a lot fewer and or further between uh, than just, you know, the common agent that sells a few houses every year or maybe a lot of houses every, every, every year. But they're fun to do and something you might want to take a look at. But gets one of the but you're going to have to have an intermediary if it's going to be a delayed exchange for sure. Let's look at number 14, because the seller can't take the money. <laughs> the IRS is going to come crashing down on them. property taxes are determined by a municipality through a process known as appraisal, escheat, assessment, or evaluation. Okay. Well, we even have an office that the county governments have there, and it's called the assessor's office. So, hey, out of all these guys, it's not an appraisal. What they do kind of looks like an appraisal, but it's not an appraisal. It's an assessment. And uh, it's not a it's cheat. You know, see the S and it's cheat. That's when the state, the e, you know, ES, the S stands for state. And then look at the rest of the word cheat. You know, it's cheat is when someone dies in test state. In other words, they could have had a will and the will could have given it to the University of Utah or, you know, they could have given it to BYU. I mean, come on, you know, blue or red, you know, pick your favorite color. Uh, but you didn't leave it to anyone. You know, you had no heirs, no heirs could be found. Ownerless property really doesn't benefit anyone. So most states have laws that say the property sits around with no owners and, you know, pe people died and we've done an investigation. We can't find any owners. Then the state could take it. In other words, state cheats you out of it. That's what the S stands for. S, state cheats you out of it. <laughs> well, you're dead anyway. What difference does it make? But um, owner's property doesn't benefit anyone. And that's why they can do that. Unfortunately, though, the people that want to go work for the state office of as cheating <laughs> it's just not called that but um it doesn't happen that often 
Because in Utah, it takes five years. What happens before the is cheat uh, in most cases? Okay, there, there could be exceptions, of course, because somebody probably screwed up, but, but it, it's, uh, it goes for a tax sale. You know, tax sales in Utah, if you're not paying, if you're dead, you know, you're not interested in paying your property taxes anymore. You have, you know, other things, you know, you got to get to your heart class and yeah, that's not even funny. But anyway, it, you, you know, you've got it. You've, you've got other things you're worried about when, once you get on the other side, um, that's not it. It's not as, as cheap. It's these values are done by the uh, assessment department. And, you know, and it, a lot of states have what's called a, a transfer tax. And, and when they do a transfer tax, it's really kind of cool, you know, because it can help us too, if you know the code, okay? Because what happens is they stamp the deed and there's a very small tax, you know, maybe it's a, you know, a few cents per thousand on a sale. So uh, it's stamped and there's a $38 transfer fee, you know, 38 transfer tax. Well, you know, to collect, accommodate, account for, you know, transfer, you know, thirty-eight dollars probably costs more state government to collect and uh, handle all that money than than the thirty-eight dollars was worth. So it's really not a tax that was generated to create more money. It's a tax to help the assessor's office because the assessor knows the code and they knows that if there is a transfer tax of thirty-eight bucks. That the property sold for three hundred eighty thousand because in most deeds they don't write in the deed the property sold for three hundred thirty eight thousand dollars, okay, or three hundred eighty thousand dollars. They you don't they don't put it in there. They put ten dollars and other good and valuable consideration. Oh, so how are we going to know what it sells for? Well, we need to for the transfer tax. It's stamped on the deed. You know, most states have that. It's cool. It's not evaluation. It's not as as cheat. It's not an appraisal. It's an assessment. It looks a lot like an appraisal and they have similar training, but they're assessors, not appraisers. Okay, number four, number 15. 15 says, what kind of taxes determine relative to the value of a property? Well, guys, it's ad valorem. B, it's not a special assessment. A special assessment is when you know, the, the city comes in and you know, we have a lot of this happening in Sandy, the city of Sandy here up you know, in the Salt Lake metro area where we had a lot of old Sandy that didn't have a uh, curb and gutter and sidewalk. And uh, the city decided, well, we need curb and gutter and sidewalk. So they took a lot of these old properties been built, you know, back in the 60s and whatnot, and they put in curb and gutter and sidewalk. But but they charged the individual property owners, depending on the frontage that their property, you know, it, it, because everyone had to pay their fair share of the cost to put the curb and gutter and sidewalk in. OK, cool. But that That's a special assessment. And it, and it uh, that's not what we're talking about here. This is relative to the value of the property, not the improvement that they recently did. It's not a transfer tax. That's a very short little bit of tax that's put on a property. Uh, normally, it's stamped on a deed to help the assessor's office determine what properties are selling for. And a, a comparative tax, I don't even know what that is. You know, it's probably a made up term, although it shouldn't be. But, you know, that that's a gobbledygook. According to value, ad valorem, that's it. Always on the test. Guys, know that one for sure. Let's look at number 16, please. Okay, we're back on six. We're up to 16 now. Property tax amounts for an individual properties are determined by what? Property tax amounts. Okay, well, first of all, we got an assessment and then we have a tax rate and that's what they're determined by, but it's not broker opinion. It's not an appraisal. Okay, uh, it's that assessment thing again. You know, the counties have a whole assessment department. Now, they look like appraisers. They talk like appraisers, uh, but they're not licensed as appraisers. They're like, you know, they're hired as assess assessors. OK, so the correct answer is 16. It's it's not your broker price opinion. It's not an appraisal. It's definitely not a CMA that what we use to help value properties. It's the county assessor. That's what they you know, they determine the value. And of course, then there's a tax rate, which, you know, is the mill levy and whatnot that we're looking at. So the correct answer to number 16 is C. Thank you very much. Highlight that. And we're looking at number 17 now, which is going to wrap things up for tonight. But when a municipality wants to replace the sidewalks on the street, they may collect from the residents of that street <laughs> with a what? <laughs> Aftermarket tax, made up term. Transfer tax, oh, that's just a little fee. Sometimes isn't even worth collecting because it's so small and to account for it, and, you know, costs more money than, than the money they collected. A special assessment tax, 
that one. We, we, that's the definition of special assessment. They just threw the word tax on there. It's not a tax penalty. Tax penalty is what you pay when you don't pay your taxes on time. Okay. A little bit of penalty. Thanks for being with us tonight. You know, we have a whole lot of these reviews and I, I've received such positive uh, response from a lot of our students because actually analyzing very similar questions of what you're going to be experiencing on the exam is a great way to prepare for the exam. You know, once you've completed your cat, your uh, your uh, your hours assignments for the state, and you're cramming for the test, come back and watch a lot of these short little videos. They usually run about an hour or so, uh, but they're going to get get you great exposure to usually under twenty, you know, somewhere between fifteen and eighteen, nineteen questions. Uh, that if you're if you're getting really good on these, okay, you're ready to take the test. If you want a test to show if you're ready to take the real test, <laughs> okay, one of them is our school tests, and we have other practice exams too. Well, this is Rick. Thanks for being with us uh, for this little short review tonight. I hope it's very helpful for you. Look, you're on the cusp of getting your license and, and uh, enjoying a great career. You know, it's it's a great time to get into the real estate business. There's a lot of cool things happening right now, but there's always people wanting to buy, wanting to sell that must buy and must sell, you know? And uh, hey, buyer's market, seller's market, it's always a realtor's market. Thanks for being with us tonight. Watch some more of these reviews. I think you'll really enjoy them. Thank you, Dan. Talk to you next time. Thanks for watching. If you want to show some appreciation to our instructors, be sure to like and subscribe so that they see how much you've enjoyed it. And if you want any additional review material, check the links below for our full suite of practice materials for the real estate license exam. Thank you.